I really want cities to think about every time someone is doing construction yeah. on a street, yeah. but this street is three lanes wide, plus a Brufford bike lane, plus, plus uh, parking on either side. It's yeah. really, really wide. Yeah. And I mean, I was just down there today and most days that I'm down there, someone has closed off at least at least one lane of traffic plus the bike lane. And so it's funny to me that we have these arguments about like we couldn't possibly close a lane because there's gonna be so much traffic and we're missing out on the opportunity to show people like this lane has actually been closed more than it has been open. <laughs> and you can see this is like the middle of the day. It's like right. the lunch hour, yeah. not a lot of traffic. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was Warren Logan from Oakland, California. And I'm so excited to share this conversation with you uh, about his experience in Oakland, uh, specifically through <laughs> the midst of COVID and the pandemic and the lockdown and uh, uh, him, you know, putting slow streets out there in the city of Oakland and uh, many of the important lessons that uh, he came away with. Uh, so it's a long one and it's a good one. And so let's get right to it. Warren, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I am absolutely delighted to, to have you here and to be able to, to talk a little bit about some of your experience uh, in your career. Uh, but let's, let's kick it off by just having you introduce yourself. Uh, who is Warren Logan? <laughs> That's a great question. Who is Warren Logan? I ask myself that every day when I wake up. Uh, today, Warren Logan is, um, I, I work at Lighthouse Public Affairs as a partner in government relations. And what's interesting about that role is that I still get to talk with all of the same people that I worked with for the 10 plus years when I was a government transportation planner. But I think many of your listeners and folks out there will know me as Slow Streets Warren, as Bike Lanes Warren, as Bart Warren. And, and it's really exciting to see my career kind of and its trajectory change, but remain squarely focused on how do we help people move around cities safely, actively, uh, equitably, and ideally, for my sake, connect with people along the way and share their stories in as best a way as possible. Yeah, yeah. And if I remember correctly, you know, I think one of your taglines is something along the lines of let's make cities what, equitable and sustainable. That's is that right. Correct? Yep. Let's make cities equitable and sustainable. So in your definition, what do those two words actually mean? Yeah, that's a great question. I think in terms of equity, I focus primarily on advancing racial equity, which underscores so many of the different types of inequities uh, that people experience, especially in American cities. Uh, you know, as a black queer man in Oakland, I recognize every day that while I have plenty of privilege in my own right, there are so many different experiences that both myself and people who look and sound and act like me struggle with throughout the day, whether it's moving around on a bus, on a bike, driving, et cetera. Um, and so I think about how both the built environment, government policies, and even private uh, companies can advance racial equity and really reset the playing field for people who've been kind of left behind. Uh, from a sustainability standpoint, I would hope that everyone recognizes that climate change is not only knocking on our door, it is like broken through every window and that it is time for us to think really concretely about how we are going to dial back our carbon emissions and think through how to even become more resilient as weather patterns change and so on. And so when we think about those two things together, racial equity and climate change and sustainability, those two things have to go hand in hand because it's very easy to address, I think, climate change while also forgetting all of the history of black and brown people in this country and how climate change is probably going to affect them in a totally different way than a, a, another person. Right, yeah. Um, so you're there in the Bay Area now. Um, where'd you grow up? Funny enough, uh, I'm in Oakland today, but I grew up in San Diego, which is a very ah. different place than okay. Oakland. Okay. Um, and I, I grew up primarily in an affluent white neighborhood being, I would say, the only black family in the whole district. Okay. And so um, it's, it's really telling, I think, now that I live in the Bay, to see what it's like to feel not only that I belong, but that my identity is celebrated. And I think that's what really keeps me in the Bay and frankly, what attracted me up here in the first place 
was being around a group of people who either look and sound and act like me right. or are celebrating all of our differences along the way. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I have that Southern California and Northern California connection too. So I uh, was born in the Los Angeles area and um, I'm actually a fourth generation Los Angelino. Um, wow. But I actually grew up as a kid in Northern California in a, a small, on a little ranch in a small, uh, uh, at the time, ranching community um, just off of I-80 um, on the way up to Lake Tahoe. So uh, okay. not not far from, from where you're at now. Um, We've got and, an exchange program. Yeah. <laughs> one yeah. for one. Well, and I still, I, I have a love-hate relationship with, with Southern California. I mean, it, down in the San Diego area, I used to go down and surf a lot down. Um, one of my favorite spots was was like in the, the cliffs there in Del Mar, which, by the way, those cliffs are actually collapsing right now. That's right. <laughs> and uh, right Million the dollar homes are. falling into the sea. Yes, exactly, which is a whole other topic. Um, yeah. But... Uh, uh, and, and I did my undergrad at USC. So right there in Los Angeles, how about you? Uh, I actually went to Occidental college, oh, just fantastic. up the freeway, but yeah. all of my best friends were at USC. So I spent yeah. quite a bit of my undergraduate days at USC. So it's, right. it is almost as if I graduated from there, but I, I didn't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And uh, and uh, and Oxy, a, a, a fabulous school as well. And um, I've I've been amazed going back to Southern California and seeing some of the transformations that have been taking place. Uh, Los Angeles has pl been playing catch up in terms of transit, and so they're really working to to build out the the metros and and the and the, the rail lines and getting. But it feels like transit. now they're jumping ahead of us. You know, yeah. the fact that they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, right. uh, expanding the metro lines everywhere. Right. I, I dream of a day that we are in the Bay Area talking about 10 different transit lines being expanded in the next five years. That That is transformational. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I talk about, too, is, you know, because uh, it, it's only been just recently when uh, my, my grandmother had passed away uh, a, a couple of years ago. But I would reflect on the fact that I could fly from here in, in Austin into LAX and then with just a little little bit of a transfer, uh, be able to, to basically get on a train and uh, be able to make it towards the USC area and, uh, you know, then hop on uh, another line uh, that would take me through Pasadena and, and that gold line going through Pasadena mm -hmm. would go right through, right past where our, our family home was in, in the Highland Park area. Yeah. And, uh, and then I think I got that right. Highland Park. Uh-huh. That's yeah, right. That that's is, that is the right there. Uh -huh. And then it, then it curves around and then out towards uh, where, where grandma was, which was out in the, the, uh, um, the little village of Glendora. Yeah. Out along the the I you know 210 corridor. And um and so it is interesting to kind of see that dynamic, that that change and the comparison, the compare and contrasting between uh, the Southern California existence and, and it was really, really focused on automobiles pretty much for yeah. my entire adult life, and to be able to see them starting to invest in uh, more transit-oriented stuff. And uh, they integrated the bike share program with the Metro there. And so they had that going. Uh, they're yep. playing catch up, trying to do Dutch style protected bikeways. And that's taking yeah. forever for that to happen. Um, talk about the existence of Oakland in particular and, and, and what that is like. And then maybe for, for folks that aren't really con, you know, familiar with the difference between Oakland and across the Bay in San Francisco, what's it like to be able to get around uh, through transit, walking, and biking in those environments, in those two different environments? Yeah, John, that's a great question. Oakland is uh, not a very large city. Um, right. I, sometimes it, I want it to be much bigger, but it is 450-ish uh, thousand people, depending on right. the day. Uh, Oakland sits just on the other side of the San Francisco Bay from San Francisco. So the bridge sort of crosses from right. here to there. What's interesting is that Oakland, and I think this is surprising for a lot of people, Oakland's landmass is larger than San Francisco's, but San okay. Francisco has doubled the population. And so you can kind of understand the scale difference and the, and the feeling of density where virtually anywhere you go in San Francisco feels like there are a lot of people, even though in Oakland, there's more space and fewer people. So it, that can sometimes feel a bit like we act as a suburb to San Francisco. Okay. What's changed though, 
in the last several years. And I think this is due in great part to both economic shifts, mayors come and gone, especially have positioned Oakland as its own city that is not the ugly stepsister to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. All of the cultures here, all of the most vibrant people are here. People want to live in Oakland. And I think that that's stellar. What that also means, though, is that from a cultural standpoint, I think that Oakland, and forgive me, I've only lived here 10 years, and there are plenty of people who've lived here for 50 and 60 and 70 and 80 years that are like, you know nothing. But in my 10 years, I've experienced quite a few demographic shifts that I think really spell a a change for the the way people identify as Oaklanders, the way people understand neighborhoods, the way people kind of navigate throughout the city, um, both socially and physically. So our city is mostly flat except for the hills that line the edge of the city. And so for anybody who lives in the flats, holding aside traffic safety, it is very easy to bicycle around. So I have an an electric bike, I have a Van Moof, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, And during the pandemic, when traffic was very, very low, all of the meetings that I had to take as an emergency director, I would just bike to them. And it was way easier than needing to drive because I hate looking for parking and I really don't like driving. Um, What's interesting though is that unlike San Francisco, uh, AC Transit is a special district that is much larger than uh, Oakland. And so Oakland doesn't control the transit systems that run through it. We are just merely a stakeholder at the table. Uh, I would say, and I think a lot of Oaklanders would disagree with me, we do not have traffic in the city right. uh, compared to coming from Los Angeles, where you know I remember driving on the 10 from Santa Monica back up to Eagle Rock and spending three hours in traffic. I've never done that in the Bay at all. Right. Uh, but I think that our relationship to the Bay could be that we are the center, right? All of the train lines come through here, Amtrak's here, the BART station. So all, we, this is surprising for a lot of people, Oakland has the most BART stations, even more than San Francisco. I think okay. we have one more than San Francisco. Uh, so we've got Amtrak, we've got BART, we've got all of the heavy rail that goes into the port. Uh, we've got our own airport. We really are an awesome city that has so much potential. And you'll probably hear me say that a lot, and a lot of other folks have said this too, Oakland has so much potential, and we're at this critical point where we need to figure out how to take advantage of that potential without losing our soul, our identity along the way. Right. And, you know, just like in Los Angeles and just like here in Austin, um, you have major highways, major interstates that cut right through the fabric of the city. And... And, and really, as I recall, and, and I'm thinking, you know, back to the last time I was in uh, Oakland, which wasn't that long ago, it really feels like you're this, you know, the city, the fabric of the city gets cut off from other parts because of the, the highways going through there. That's especially true um, for West Oakland, where, where I live, where coming to you today from West Oakland, uh, there are two major freeways that sort of line the flats of uh, sort of deep East Oakland, East Oakland, and then ultimately into the sort of Lake Merritt area and downtown. So that's 580 and 880 before, you know, they sort of turn north and head towards Berkeley and Emeryville and and, and beyond. What's interesting about Oakland is that unlike, I would say, San Diego, especially, uh, our freeways had to rip through existing neighborhoods. Our, our, Our communities were built around a more hub and spoke system, really the way AC transits lines used to run um, when we used to have dozens and dozens of trains running through uh, uh, Oakland. Oakland right now, though, and we'll probably get to this later, is having a conversation about whether or not we need so many freeways. And specifically, the Interstate 980 that connects sort of the 24 freeway from 580 down to 880. It's It's a very short stretch that was intended to be another bridge to San Francisco that ultimately was never built. Um, Jerry Brown, I wasn't there, but I suppose insisted that the freeway be built, even though Caltrans had said, we're not planning on building this bridge anymore. Uh, And what's going to be especially interesting is that on one hand, I'm a major proponent of removing that freeway because I think freeways, especially cutting through black and brown neighborhoods are racist. And it represents a tremendous opportunity to rethink where the second BART tunnel should enter from San Francisco to Oakland. 
and whether or not I want to say 13 acres of land might be repurposed for much needed housing at all of affordability levels that we just don't have um, right now here in the city. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that I, that I uh, think of, cause you, you mentioned the port is right there too. And so uh, that's one of the, in fact, the reason why I was most recently there was to uh, retrieve our, our, our motor vehicle from Hawaii. When we moved, oh, well. you know, from Hawaii to, to, to Austin, uh, we had to, you know, Put, put put our one and only motor vehicle on the boat, and, and a, you know, a month later or whatever it was, it, it showed up in Oakland, and so I had to fly in there and retrieve it from there. And so uh, I had a, an appreciation for that that juxtaposition of the port, the freeway system, mm-hmm. the historic downtown area, and and the neighbors, the the other uh, neighborhoods that were nearby there, and. Yeah. Um, and it made me think of some of the work that uh, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Dick Jackson uh, from UCLA, although he lives there in Berkeley, um, he had studied and talked about a lot the, uh, the problem with air pollution and um, the impact on children's asthma situation with, uh, associated with the bunker fuel, with the port and the issues that are going on there. But then also, again, those major freeways cutting right through those neighborhoods. Yeah, it's it's certainly, I mean, as a resident of West Oakland, I experience it every day. And I, I just moved over here two years ago. I take my finger across our patio yeah. and it's black with yeah. soot. And so it's a really interesting relationship that Oakland residents and by extension employees have to our transportation system because in many respects, we rely on the freeway system because we didn't, build out a, a even more robust transit system. Right. And at the same time, the thing that we rely on to get around and to connect us to jobs that have since sort of relocated across the bay uh, is also killing us. Right. And that is, as a transportation planner, especially one of the most challenging conversations I regularly had in the mayor's office and even as a consultant with the city before, where people could understand that this thing that they needed so much was like hurting them, right. but couldn't imagine, understandably, what an alternative would look like because the relationship between affordable housing, economic development, and jobs placement, and transportation were just so difficult, right? right? Like we spent a lot of time disinvesting in city centers, right? Yeah. Uh, redlining black and brown folks away from from high resource areas, and then expecting those people to then take transit and bike back uh, is just a very challenging um, paradox. Yeah, yeah. When um, you look at the the trips, because and this is going to relate to some of the challenges that uh, that that sort of bubbled up uh, during the pandemic. Um, when you look at the trips that that. Oaklanders are, are, are taking on a daily basis. Um, I reflect back and think about, you know, most North American cities have a pretty significant number of trips that are inherently bikeable distances. And you, you alluded to that earlier is that, yeah, it was just more practical and pragmatic for you to jump on the bike and go. Are you seeing that too from in the data uh, in in the Oakland area is that there's a significant number of trips, whether that's, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of trips, uh, you know, being in that bikeable distance. And it's just a matter of creating bikeable, you know, streets and routes. I think that's true to a point. And Oakland is a really unique situation that I that I think a lot of medium-sized cities in the country are, are facing right now, which is that each individual trip from home to the grocery store and back, for example, may be a bikeable distance, but it's that chain effect where it's like, well, I'm not just going to the grocery store. I'm going to go pick up my kids. Then I got to run a few more errands. Then I got to get back. That I think people start to calculate that that round trip, that chain Mm -hmm. is not bikeable for them. And it's, I, I also want to call out for a second though, that distance is not always the metric that right. people use to calculate whether or not they should bike. It's, it's right. comfort, especially. Right. Um, I had the privilege of bicycling through Germany and Amsterdam, especially. You can go a really long way on an e-bike and not feel like you've gone that far. Right. Because um, of the comfort level. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so one of the things that 
I kind of, when I left the mayor's office and was working with the DOT at that time, one of the things that we started talking about was how we're not just going to focus on painting bike lanes everywhere, which don't get me wrong, we should definitely do, but that we needed to start thinking about how we could use potential greenways uh, to encourage people to take those longer trips in a more, um, I would say, dignified and also enjoyable manner. The other part, though, that I want to sort of flex on for a second is that a lot of Oaklanders are not traveling to San Francisco or not even traveling to the center of job centers. And so I learned this kind of unfortunately in a weird way that there are a number of people who are so poor they have to drive. And that's a, that's a really difficult thing for people to kind of wrap their heads around because we typically think about driving as a privilege. And in the last, I would say, decade or so, living near a transit-oriented development space, living across the street from your office or in the same neighborhood, that's privilege. Being able to bike the distances you need to in a complete neighborhood or a complete city, that's actually where affluence lives now. And so where lots of people might be driving through Oakland to get to San Francisco or were before the pandemic, a lot of Oaklanders are going everywhere else. And right. that's, oops, sorry, everywhere else. And yeah. so that's something that's really hard to kind of capture. And I will say that we don't have great data on what are people doing, I, I, I don't want to say post-COVID, we're very much in COVID still. Right. But the feedback I received in 2020 and in 2021 during the Slow Streets program was that the folks who were able to enjoy these brand new slow streets in their neighborhoods We're also the folks who are able to work from home, whereas the people who, and I would say sort of broad brush here, the folks living in deep East Oakland, especially sort of the 60th Avenue on to 108th, we're like, we're not, we don't have time to do this because we're we're still going to work. And better yet, we're not going to take transit because we're going in the opposite direction. And so understanding that type of travel pattern is really, really critical. The other component as well is that the type of travel pattern that we're very used to focusing on and from a planning standpoint is the commute trip from work to right. home, home to work, you know. Uh, and it turns out people are traveling in lots of other ways, which right. we kind of knew, right? But that yeah. when you release people from that nine to five commute pattern, whether because they're working from home or because they have flexible schedule, whatever, you start to realize that there are all these other trips that really have an impact on the way people travel and make their decisions. And that it is not just, if I put a bike lane here, maybe you will bike to work. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. And and I was very intentional about the way I phrased it too, in in terms of the total number of trips, because uh, you know, in, in really from in the parlance of active towns, we're, we're like really trying to push for the build out of, being able to empower uh, people to be able to get to all their meaningful destinations. You know, yeah. they should be able to, to, to get to, you know, the, be able to do, accomplish those trip chaining types of, of, you know, trips that they have and going, oh yeah, no, I'm going to the daycare or I'm going to the school right. and then I'm going over here and then I'm going over there. And, and oftentimes those are that sort of trip chaining is done with, you know, with maybe even caregivers yeah. uh, of going, yeah, it's, it's a bunch of them. Now, I, I, I want to uh, pop on over to this per, uh, pre- presentation here that you gave uh, earlier this year in, in uh, February. And uh, I, I'm pausing and lingering on this photo because this is one of the, the images of of you know, kind of Oakland, uh, from my many visits in the area. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not the same level of density that I'm used to over across the Bay and in San Francisco. It's a little bit more like this. Um, and, and I love this, this density it's, it's, you know, compared to like what we see here in, in Austin, uh, mm-hmm. we would die for this level of density. You know? right. <laughs> it's it's what I call gentle density. But sure. it also, I love this photo too, because it gives you a nice little cross section of, you know, who the people are, who the residents are in the community. Um, let's pop over to this second slide, because this uh, kind of also closes the loop on uh, your introduction. And uh, I noticed a few, you know, logos in here. Uh, Walk us through uh, what we're looking at here. 
Uh, chaos is what you're looking at. Um, <laughs> so you're not a partner with, with Lighthouse now. And, that's uh, right. Let's yeah. let's work backwards. It's funny, when I try and describe my professional experience to people, they're like, that's a lot of different work. And I, yeah. I want to try and first draw what connects all of these things. It's, it's yeah. people. Yeah. Um, I have been told that I am militantly gregarious, and I think that that's fitting. Uh, but I also am incredibly curious about how everything works when it right. comes to cities, especially when it comes to transportation. And, and that curiosity has led me to work at a number of different agencies, a number of different levels of government, and in a number of different cities. So starting with the city of Berkeley, um, when I was actually still in graduate school, I got a really amazing job working for the city's transportation division and helped manage a, a parking and a value price parking program and a uh, travel demand management program. And my job was to help the city understand where all of the employees in these um, sort of dense districts, downtown, south side of campus, and then Elmwood, which is a much smaller commercial district, why they were driving, not just whether they were driving, we knew they were driving, but to understand what their motivations were. Um, and to ask some really difficult questions, like if we gave you a transit pass, would you change your mind, right? If we encouraged you to carpool, what would you do? And and sort of playing out that, you know, three-dimensional chess of, you know, pulling this lever, doing this, will we be able to free up parking spaces and sort of reduce the demand for driving in the city? Right. Uh, soon thereafter, I worked at a place called Community Design and Architecture that specializes in urban design, which is actually what I, I have my graduate degree in, is transportation and urban design. Because, you know, even as a kid, I love to draw and, and just sort of like graphically represent the world around me. And so being able to literally design the streets right around me was a really interesting opportunity to just like say, okay, this brick is the color that we're going to use. This tree is the tree we're going to plant. That level of granularity is something that I think a lot of people forget is designed. Like everything around you is is a choice right. that someone has made, whether actively or passively. But someone designed that, and yeah. and being able to have that opportunity to learn why trees have to be fifteen feet from each other and their root systems, like all that was so fascinating. Again, though, most of the time I spent other than on InDesign and Illustrator and CAD was com connecting with community groups to say, how do we both accurately represent your community as it is now, but then let's sort of stand around a whiteboard and a canvas and say, what would you like to see in the future? What do you want your community to look like next year, 10 years, 20 years down the road? And that's a critical question to ask right there. Yes. And, and you know, this is something that I learned in spades across the next several uh, jobs is that people don't know what they, what they really want. And I think that's right. because as government professionals, as city planners, even as government affairs professionals now, we don't do a great job of explaining what the menu of options is. And especially for black and brown people, we've been told that the options are so limited that we might as well just give up, yeah. just accept what you have in front of you. And the thing that I take the most joy in is trying to help people understand just how many options they have and what the trade-offs are for them so that at least we're having a debate about all of the different possibilities instead of sort of a slim uh, subsection of what's available to them. Right. Jumping ahead, I worked at the San Francisco County Transportation Authority, uh, managing the city's response to shared mobility. And I'm going to put you back to 2016, 2017, 2018, where Uber and Lyft were handing out free rides like lollipops. Right, right. And at the same time in, in San Francisco at the time, we had scooters everywhere. Right. And it just seemed like the sky was going to fall down for a lot of people. Right. And trying to be a liaison to those companies and understand what's your goal here, friend? Like, what are you, what are you trying to do? Because uh, we don't trust you. <laughs> not only do we not trust you, but we also don't yeah. understand you. Right, right. And it was a challenging experience, certainly, because I had the, I think, wonderful experience of trying to bridge this divide between the city and county of San Francisco that was, and I think to some degree continues to be relatively distrustful of a tech industry that is grown up in that city, which is an interesting right, dialogue right. we can have in another day. Yeah. Uh, 
but trying to sort of figure out, well, what are, what do we want? And then are you helping us meet those goals or not? And at the same time, trying to sort out if we're willing to let you help. And that's that was the really challenging, almost political dialogue of, and even ego too, to say, yeah, they might be better at this thing. Right. And maybe we can learn something. Um, and maybe they can learn from us. What are the opportunities where we can work together? Yeah. Uh, following that, I had the tremendous opportunity to work in the mayor's office for Libby Schaff here in Oakland. And I started in 2019 with uh, one job and ended in 2021 with several jobs. Uh, <laughs> most importantly, becoming an emergency director at the yeah. same time uh, as being a policy director. And while the so job So let me ask incredible. you this real quick. Yeah, please. So when in 2019? Uh, like July. Okay. Okay. So yeah, you, you, so had, I, I had, a, about, you had a few months on the job because, that's right. because along comes a little global pandemic and, and really rocks our world uh, beginning in uh, you know February and March. Mm-hmm. So fast forward to, to what happens in March for you and beyond. Uh, panic button. Yeah. Um, I got a call from <laughs> our city administrator's office right. who said, hey, you know, we'd really love you to join our emergency team and we want you to bring your skill set with you to yep. help us at the time set up testing sites. And I'm like, I'm a city planner. I don't I don't know anything about epidemiology. I'm I'm not a doctor. Right. And they're like, that's nice. Come on over. And uh, <laughs> I would say that it was, yeah, come over anyway. We need you. And I would say that that was probably maybe the most meaningful experience I've ever had mm-hmm. as a city planner to date because, and I think this is where a lot of my sort of like new ethos goes when I think about cities, is that from that same team, the our uh, community resilience team, we first launched the county's uh, testing sites in advance of even the county's efforts. Right. Uh, like truly, and I cannot underscore this enough, we would not have had testing sites for roughly the first year had our team not set them up. Right. And the New York Times posted a really amazing article that sort of hit the ball a little bit in Oakland, but mentioned that both Oakland and San Francisco were the only two cities across the country to have better uh, availability, test availability uh, for black and brown neighborhoods than their white counterparts. Okay. And that that yeah. was really telling of the, I would say, tremendous work that we did with community groups and with you know these amazing leaders in the city. Yeah. Let me tell you for a second about the team itself. Sure. You've got a chief resiliency officer, kind of my like co-lead, myself from the mayor's office as a transportation expert. Uh, we had two fire chiefs. We had a police chief. We had um, our land use attorney and our economic development uh, real estate advisor. And together, uh, I would say we did a phenomenal job because you had all of the relevant parties at the, I mean, literally at the same table, slightly distanced, double mask, you know, all fearful of the world around us, but all collectively headed towards the same mission and values with no money right. and no time to do right. the work. But that yeah. same team is the one that helped launch Slow Streets. Uh, it's also the same team that helped create our Flex Streets program, which is the parklets, the shared spaces, the market program. And I truly believe that moving forward, cities should operate this way, that they should have interdisciplinary teams to address its most pressing challenges in a really collaborative and innovative way. Because I cannot tell you the number of times where I would be banging my head against a wall trying to figure out how to solve something and one of my teammates would say, oh, you know, it's so funny you should say that because I've always wanted to tell someone in your department that you should really do it like this. Right. And they'd have the perfect solution. I'm like, where, where have you right. been? That's right. a great right. idea. And so trying to unlock that more yeah. 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 Uh, is the work we need to be doing. Yeah, yeah. Getting out of our silos and being able to do that. So, you, And you just yeah. mentioned slow streets. And so I look at this image and I, I, I kind of look at the fact that we've got some masks and we've got uh, some gloves here. Uh, was this early in, in, in the early days? This yeah, was early like days. taken in the first month of slow streets. Yeah. So what months did, did slow streets come about? Uh, it started in April of 2020 okay. and continued for about a year then on. And the version of slow streets that we launched in April 
is not the, is not the same version that we ended with. Right. And I think that that's the right thing. I think that we made all of the best decisions we could with the information we had to continuously evolve the program. We'll, we started, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, yeah. we'll, get, we'll get to the, the, because this next slide helps guide us in the direction of the evolution that took place. Absolutely. Walk us through um, what's going on here. Sure. And if we can just go back for just a second, yeah. you know, this is like day one where yeah. Oakland announces at the time, the most aggressive slow streets program. Oh, we totally. said 70, you know, 74 miles. And let's be clear, we did not reach 74 miles. We got to about 30 something and change. Yeah. But still, I mean, it was more than 10. Give me a break. It's huge. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and for that, like 24, 48 hours, it felt like we did it. Awesome. You know, like we're, <laughs> we're winning. And then the next day, change of slide, please. <laughs> this. <laughs> uh, this happened. And to me, this was the most jarring uh, response. I right. did not expect at all. You know, yeah. you've kind of got a couple of different ones here. The first of which made perfect sense. Hey, there are people still driving really recklessly and these signs are not discouraging them from doing so. And, right. and we'll talk about that in a second. The, the latter ones were really troubling. And I, I say that both as a you know, seasoned transportation planner, but also as a black man living in Oakland, right. where people were telling me and, and sort of telling the city that this program that we had set up to try and give people space to spread out so that they wouldn't catch COVID, but also for folks who didn't live near parks, who didn't have backyards, who were like, I need to get out before I burn the city down, that this was somehow a tool to kick people out of their homes, right? right? That, that it was a tool to sort of manipulate housing markets to um, affect evictions. Right. Or that similarly, anyone woke up that day and said, I want to trick black people into catching COVID by going outdoors. Yeah. And that, those responses took a lot of time for me to really hear and try and dig into how, like, how we got from zero to 60 in two seconds. Right. Uh, because I was surprised. I, you know, naturally, sure. I don't think everything I touch is going to be perfect, of course. But to go from like, oh, we've got some hiccups to you're trying to kill us. It was like, yikes. Like Whoa. this. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. But it also yeah. told me, and, and this is the thing that I had to kind of really, you know, uh, cheerlead my staff on, was that this is about something so much bigger than right. slow streets right. and trying to examine what, <laughs> what that could be right. uh, quickly, very yeah. quickly yeah. and create a space for community groups and community leaders who clearly distrust us. And some of them hate us to uh, go through, I would say a bit of therapy to try and dig deeper into slow streets is the reason I hate you too. Slow streets is emblematic of an issue I've seen for the past 30 years, and I'm telling you for the umpteenth time that here's a problem that you're not fixing. Yeah, you're not listening, um, you're not really listening to us, you're you're fixing this. That's right. And we're like, I, yeah, listen yeah. to us. <laughs> and, and a lot of people said, you know, we're not biking, we're not walking, why would we need this program? Right. And some of that has to do with messaging and signage, where, right. you know, a lot of the folks who were enjoying their slow streets in the admittedly more affluent neighborhoods in North Oakland, we're like, we're not biking and walking either. We're having dance-a-thons. But trying to start from a place of like, here's space that you can use for anything. What would you like to use it with? But even that is wrapped up in so much institutional trauma right. because black and brown people know that just crossing the street at the wrong spot might get them arrested. Right. And so we were trying to do like, 10 million things at once while, mind you, managing our response to a unprecedented pandemic, right? So you can imagine a bit of pressure that I was under. But the messaging had to be so careful to say, please go outside, but wear yeah. a mask. We want you to feel safe here, but also we're not sending the police, but you want sometimes for the police to come. Like it just, it was so complicated. Right. But but I do believe that digging through those extremely challenging conversations, truly shouting matches at times, was for me, and I, I hope that my staff agrees with this perhaps after a few years of healing, uh, 
that we were able to daylight some amazing feedback that we just weren't getting in a traditional planning process. Right. And, and this is the part that I, I want to kind of highlight because a lot of folks forget. In 2019, we had just adopted our Let's Bike Oakland Bicycle Master Plan, right. where a lot of the major detractors of slow streets had just said that they wanted these streets to feel safe to bicycle and walk on. Exactly. And yeah. so this was the disconnect and the whiplash that I think everybody in the city felt. We were like, didn't we just talk about this? And now you're pissed. Okay, like let's let's understand right. like how we got here. What's interesting too is that, you know, from this point here in in April 2020, when the news broke and you know, we all started following what you were doing and I was monitoring monitoring cities uh, across the country and around the globe that were were doing similar types of, of things. And then to 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 like hear, you know, back and hear from you yeah. and from from others there on the ground in Oakland that oh my gosh <laughs> we have an emergency here That's um right. my feedback to you is that it it seemed like and I know it must not have felt like this and seemed like it at the time for you personally but it seemed like you and your team did a, a wonderful job of deftly navigating a very, very difficult, you know, situation. So I just wanted to acknowledge that, that it didn't, you didn't just tear it all down and go away and, and say, you know, tail between your, your legs. You like really leaned into it and tried to understand and it had a new life. So let's, I mean, and yeah. listen, there were plenty of times where people are like, we got to pack this up. Yeah. And I want to express to you and your listeners what I shared with my staff, which yeah. was, you know, we could have taken the slow streets out of East Oakland where people were like, over my dead body, should these stay here? And I felt quite strongly, and I, I think I'm right, but other people can disagree with me, that's fine, that had we done that, we would have fallen into the exact trap that Oak Dot was set up to avoid by being an equitable department of transportation. You know, because truly what could have happened is we would have just set up the slow streets in the affluent neighborhoods and then the same criticism would have happened exactly. in reverse. And we I never think get one anything the, good. <laughs> right. Well, and what's yeah. interesting, though, is that not only would that have been, you know, the I'm sure the leading, you know, area of right. frustration, but what a lot of people don't know is that the first version of slow streets that was on the, you know, you know, floor by the time we were out the door was that we were going to give people the opportunity to set up their own slow streets. We weren't going to master plan it. We were just going to say, okay. you and your neighbors can, you know, and this didn't last but five seconds, but to say you, your block, or maybe you join with a couple of blocks and you can set up your trash cans or we'll give you signs. Like we were going to do it a completely different way. Right. And my feedback uh, when this kind of was first brought to me was cool. The only people who are going to do that are in North Oakland. Like, and then we've just created a program that only benefits white affluent residents. Right. Whereas I think, albeit the much more challenging route we took, was let's do it everywhere and and see if we can manage the fire along let's the see way. See what happens. <laughs> yeah, let's see what happens. Yeah. And and truly, yeah. you know, um, I think that we learned a lot. Right. I also think that we showcased both our staff's ability to be collaborative, to work extremely quickly, like faster than people expect government to work, right? Like the same people who would say, the DOT never responds to me. I want to talk to the same, you know, I want to talk to somebody. We were having citywide meetings with like all of the neighborhood leaders twice a week. Right. about this program. And and what was cool about it was that it sort of morphed into, well, since I have you here, can you give us some feedback about this? Let's talk about that. And and it started to become like its own sort of feedback forum, not just about the Slow Streets program, but then soon, you know, because we launched Flex Streets, I think two months later. So like, mind you, we're like, we were on a tear. It's crazy right, to think right, right. that we launched two citywide programs like in two months, right. um, let alone three with the testing program. And so... It, I, I share that as just a comparison of like the alternate reality that we could have been 
in where yeah. we just launched those streets where people wanted them and we set up a really inequitable program. Right. We would have never learned uh, that a significant portion of the uh, neighborhood bikeways that we had planned in the bike plan uh, were not going to work the way that we had planned them in that bike plan. Like that's that's an important feature here that right, right. Yeah. If, it, if it wasn't going to work with the signs, right. that's what was planned in the bike plan. Obviously right. the signs were a different spot, but we were able to leverage that lesson learned and go apply for a $20 million grant from the state, which we won, I think $22 million, excuse me, that completely rewrote the way that that all of those streets should be, you know, uh, re-envisioned. Right, right. Uh, similarly, we wouldn't have learned how to partner with local artists to design our uh, slow street signs. We hired a local artist who actually was kind of against the program, mm -hmm. and that was awesome. Because one of the things he shared was he was like, "These signs don't make any sense. What are you telling right. people?" Right, right. We're like, "That's a, you know," because you see here, road yeah. close to through traffic. That looks like construction. Right, and. He was right. And so what replaced that was this, you know, it really made me cry. I mean, quite literally, I'm, I'm a softie to begin with, but it made me cry because I'm sure you can, and you and your listeners can probably imagine the, you know, kids at play sign where it's like the girl in the pigtails running mm -hmm. with her, let's say brother, I don't know, like running across the street. And like, that is very different from the two girls running towards the frame, if you will. Right. And one of them has their hair in like pom poms. Yeah. And that's a very like common style for young black girls to wear their hair that way. Right. Right. And it's those tiny details, I think, that really, sorry, I'm like getting goosebumps. Like yeah. it's those tiny details that show people that we are reflecting back to them, like that, that they matter. Right. And not just, you know, some generic cardboard cutout is walking across the street, but that you are the person we're thinking about when we want people to drive slowly in your neighborhood. Right. That yeah. That's important. Yeah. Yeah. So, so incredibly important. Um, we've got a couple of uh, additional slides here. Walk us through these, these next few slides and, and, and we'll, we'll end uh, with a, a kind of a, a nice little graphic of, of where the evolution kind of went to. Yeah, totally. So during the uh, feedback phase uh, that we worked through with a number of the neighborhood leaders, they said, if you're going to spend so much time using orange cones and traffic signs to get people places, we need help, not in slow streets, but connecting to neighborhood resources, whether it's clinics, grocery stores, dry cleaners, uh, markets, um, and even testing spaces. And so this is one of several, I think we launched 20, I think by the time we finished, uh, essential places, you know, and aptly named connecting you to an essential place. Right. And what was really cool about this program was like we could set them up, you know, overnight. Right, and, right. and they were at um, important crosswalk locations, but they were just these spot treatments that helped people feel safe getting to the places they were trying to go. And I, I know that that sounds like, like, duh, we should be helping people get to the same way to the places they need to go, but that it's not just these like corridor treatments, but just as simple as crossing the street can feel incredibly scary for people uh, in these neighborhoods. And that's why they drive, even yeah. short distances. Um, I think we gained a lot of trust doing this program because it wasn't master planned. We we would meet like on a Wednesday and we'd identify a number of locations, like kind of two at a time. We'd finalize the plans by like Friday yeah. and implement the next week and then talk about it that Wednesday again. Yeah. Like the turnaround time was so fast that we were able to show community groups, we heard you and now we're going to go do it. And then tomorrow you let me know how it went. Right, and if it's not working, we'll just move the cones a little bit. Oh, yeah. let's move the sign a little bit. And and what I love about what you just said there is is that it really re reinforces that concept of lighter, quicker, cheaper, and iterative. Yeah, get that feedback and and, and, and retool. When it. the first the first essential place, you know, you see these two. This one's actually right around the corner from my house, but it's since changed. the The first round of essential places used these orange cones. Then the next round, we use soft tip posts. And then ultimately, we went back and changed a bunch of the essential places to just be concrete. 
like by the time we were going through these, we were able to then have an, the other safety team come back around and put in a more permanent uh, improvement. And so yes. while this is gone, um, this is on San Pablo kind of going north towards Emeryville, which is a diagonal street that runs from downtown Oakland. This one is gone, but we used um, this like safety dollars from the state to basically add a number of what are called um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons yes. uh, along this street. So like several of the intersections in this corridor now, just in this chunk near a grocery store, uh, are now much safer because you take them you know, half at a time. You're not trying to cross five lanes. You're just crossing two and they're signalized, which is stellar, right? Like right. to kind of go from an overnight improvement like this one to a long-term capital gain is is phenomenal. And like right. in a really, like in a year's time, right. it's it's uh, kind of amazing. Yeah, it's 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 unheard of, you know, from, from you know, that standpoint. What do we got yeah. going on here? Yeah, this um, was, you might recall, I had mentioned that we had partnered with a local artist. So this is Mayor Schaff right in the middle um, announcing our partnership with Jonathan Brimfield, who is just to her left, our right. Uh, he was a local artist who we had, um, we won, I think, $20,000 from the, the National Endowment of the Arts grant to hire a local artist to reimagine the signage and sort of the programming along one of our slow streets. And this is a really cool opportunity because it was, I think, one of the first times that we'd like hired an artist to make a municipal sign. Like you don't, you know, right. yeah. most people go to the MUTCD manual and say, here's the pedestrian sign. Right. I'll, I'll take 30. Right. Uh, but to, but to challenge ourselves to say, well, you know, I know what traffic planners think of when they think about what a safe sign looks like, but looking at it from a social or cultural competency standpoint, what sign, if there is such a sign, can we install, can we design for that matter, that is going to convey both the message that safety matters Right. But at the same time that you matter, that right. you, the person who live in this neighborhood right. matter and that we are talking about you. Um, and that's what Jonathan did for us with with um, those two girls kind of like running um, with their pom pom hair and then using um, what's called the scraper bike team, uh, which is a, a nonprofit that's in deep East Oakland that that educates young black boys primarily how to ride bicycles, how to fix bicycles, how to kind of Frankenstein them right, right, uh, yeah. into some really cool, uh, very flashy bikes. It's, it's um, kind of awesome. I'm yeah, yeah. a little jealous. I need them to like do that to my e-bike. But <laughs> to use their symbol as well to kind of give community members ownership of um, their rights of way in a right. way that like reflects their identity back to them. Yeah, such an important part. And here we go. So, he, yeah. So again, here are some signs here just uh, that we launched. And then they've since sort of changed to be full-fledged aluminum signs as well. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. Love it. And here um, we are. Yeah. And then this is our Flex Streets program that we, and, and this is kind of the funny thing, right? I'd mentioned this earlier where we gave local business owners the sort of free power to take over their streets for merchant activity. And What's neat about it is, you know, because San Francisco, along with a lot of other cities, did parklets. We all we all did parklets. Right. I think Oakland did parklets better than everybody <laughs> else, but that's not because they were more expensive, better built, um, anything but, in fact. Uh, what's interesting is that we showed, I think, the world how much you can accomplish with very little. Right. Um, and that our business owners, our merchants, our residents, um, even our visitors are so creative. You know, the one, the parklet that's here on the left side is in downtown Oakland out, out front of a, a business called The Hatch. Uh, and the owner there hired local artists from two blocks over to wrap that, uh, you know, space in their artwork. So right. not only was he able to hire local people to build out the parklet, he then hired more students, There, you know, there's an art school nearby, to like draw out what, you know, the design should look like on that space, um, which I think is so cool. And like, yeah. who's doing that, right? Like we, we did that. Um, and at the same time, just because we're layering on culture here, uh, just a month or two prior to that parklet, um, you can kind of see at the edge of the screen there, 
that's one of the couple of streets that received the Black Lives Matter mural on the street itself. Oh, so okay, there's so it. many layers of right. identity sort of packed onto this one block that has since turned into um, three blocks of parklets that are kind of becoming okay. like its own festival street. Um, and right. they have since um, partnered with a, a local developer around the corner to once again reimagine what a, a more permanent uh, sort of set of structures that look even more cohesive um, would look like. And is uh, that is uh, pedestrian only or is that uh, some form of slow street? Great question. So they actually, this is my um, creative policy making. Mm-hmm. We, uh, I don't know if your um, listeners have, have heard of a children's book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, but I apply that logic to the way that I apply policy, which is like, mm-hmm. well, if you want a parklet, are you sure you don't want a street closure <laughs> permit? And if you want a street closure permit, are you sure you don't want a festival program? You know, so we kept kind of one-upping people at their right. own game because incidentally, um, our traffic engineers had said, we would really prefer if there was no car traffic, like that's actually safer. Right. And I was like, great deal. Let's do that then. And so we gave these businesses two permits. So there are parklets there and they are able to close the street off for special events as well. And I think that that type of flexibility is the thing that I I really want Oaklanders and really, frankly, everybody to see their streets as is like these flexible spaces that maybe one day cars drive there, but the next day it's a festival. Like many of us have experienced street fairs and don't connect the dots that like the once a month thing that we do for the local bars or whatever could be more than once a month, could be every evening, right? right? Like that type of temporality that you can kind of play with and stretch is so critical when we think about like rethinking um, our, our public spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. So that brings us to, um, you know, sort of this graphic where we have the, the slow streets and then we have the, the flex streets. Uh, walk us through. Yeah. So it's funny. And I, I so enjoyed this presentation because I've, I've used this graphic in a couple of different ways. Yeah. Because come back. I come back. Um, so I've used this graphic in a couple of different ways because I liked I like to highlight for people that our programs are not in silos. That we are trying right. to learn different things and then and then apply them crossways. Right. So one of the areas of feedback that we got from our slow streets program was we're not biking. We're at home. You know, working or you know. We don't want them every day, but we would like to have programming that looks like a market. So you'll see kind of in the top right, someone had said, well, can I use my slow street as a flex street? And at first my staff were like, well, yeah, like you don't, you don't need us for that. But then we realized like, oh, you're talking about programming. Like we, we need to say yes, like go ahead. And so that's where we started to think through, like how might we apply the flex streets model to a neighborhood street? Uh, yeah. similarly, one of the things that I, uh, an Easter egg that I left, you know, back at the city right before I left was that a number of folks who lived in neighborhoods that didn't have very much green space and have trees and so on had asked us, well, why is it that business owners can take over their parking spaces for their own merchant activity? I've got a parking space out front of my house. I would rather it be used as a space where I plant a couple of trees. Can mm-hmm. I have a parklet in front of my house? And so um, that was an area that we started to explore. And I'm, I apologize, I don't know where it landed now, but I've never seen a city have residential parklets. But for a city like Oakland that desperately, it's funny, our, our name is a tree, uh, <laughs> we need to have a better tree canopy. There are plenty of areas in the city uh, that do not have enough trees. And, and, and we, as we think about the effects of climate change, being able to rapidly implement uh, urban greenways uh, is going to be really important. Right. Um, so it's, it's the sort of cross-pollination between these two programs that I think was so critical. And I, I believe in this, so we're going to have to cut for a second. There's another graphic that is my mind meld to try and explain to people that there were like seven programs that we started to think through how all all of these different pieces connect together and being able to sort of explain to community groups that their feedback from the paint the town program where you could paint murals on your streets 
we were now going to apply to the Slow Streets program. And the feedback that we got from the Slow Streets program, we were now going to apply to the Flex Streets program. And so instead of getting feedback in a siloed manner, like tell us what you think about parklets, we were able to say, tell us what you think about space. And then we're going to start to move around all of our different assets and ideas so that we're constantly delivering the best thinking that we can at, at the time and better yet as quickly as possible because right. it doesn't work for us to learn uh from our feedback from our mistakes slowly like right. the point is to you probably heard this in design thinking fail fast right right uh, yeah. and so that's the thing that we were trying to do i mean we weren't trying to fail but trying to learn from our mistakes as quickly as possible. So if we learned something from slow streets, we needed to make damn sure that we were applying that to our flex streets program as well. Right. Yeah. And what's really interesting too, when you think about how um, all of that played out, you got some very, very critical information and feedback that is not only helpful for you and you know, probably your future career, but also uh, for other cities. What were those learnings? Yeah, I, I think first and foremost, the most important lesson learned for me was that really anything is possible. You know, when I started in the mayor's office in I think July of 2019, I don't think my mandate was to try and close 74 miles of streets overnight and to find out that we could even approximate that goal in a matter of six or 12 months is phenomenal, right? Holding even aside all of the controversy around it, that that is in, in fact possible to advance this level of traffic safety, this, this amount of reimagining of our public spaces that quickly means that we need to be applying that level of thinking to everything that we're doing, not just transportation planning, but economic development, housing, and so on. Similarly, I learned a great deal more about the levels of distrust that people have for government, that we might think we know just how much local, state, federal government has burned POC residents, but it goes even deeper than that. And, and trying to hold that dear and, and get as much feedback as possible about the ways that we can heal as quickly as possible is some of the most rewarding experiences I've had, albeit the most challenging times I've had as, as a career transportation planner. Um, but perhaps most finally, seeing the resilience even of my own staff to dedicate themselves to work that they did not sign up for at a time when it felt like the sky was on fire and truly in, in the Bay Area when it was that the sky was on fire, um, to see people turn into superheroes overnight was phenomenal. And, and I really tip my hat to them at the end of the day for taking on such a, such a fantastic challenge with such great strength and um, through, you know, such adversity, especially. Yeah. So what's the, the story behind uh, these two photos here? Yeah. So these two photos are um, of of various salsa lessons that are occurring at our newest, um, I would say, public open space called Brooklyn Basin. And truly, this space, I think, represents like the best of Oakland in so many ways. The fact that we have, um, I think, what's planned almost 4,000 housing units, affordable and market rate, next to this beautiful shoreline with a view of the city, a view of downtown Oakland at the same time, there are at times three different salsa lessons happening at once. Mm -hmm. And then just at the end, with probably the best view, of course, is um, uh, a drag queen performance on roller skates. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and that to me is like so Oakland. Like right, right. The, it's called Rowing with the Homos. And it is just like phenomenal <laughs> because you've got like parents with their kids enjoying the show you know, skating around, taking laps, doing tricks. Right behind you is every kind of dance <laughs> lesson happening. And then in the mornings, you've got like yoga lessons. It's just like, this is the type of way that I want people to be using our space. And, and granted, and I think this connects us even back to Slow Streets to some degree, 
the fact that we're able to use just a blank canvas, the space in this way shows me that, I mean, we have streets that are wider than this park. Why right. can't we use them in that same way? And, and I'll just share really quickly. Uh, I didn't know this about Oakland, but apparently we have a very deep culture in roller skating, like really, really deep culture. Uh, and yeah. so one of the things that we saw pop up during the pandemic was that people were kind of taking over slow streets on the weekends and having like roller skating parties and playing disco music. And there's actually one right down the street from my house that is yeah. now looking for, you know, a, a private partner to fund like a roller rink. Right. And so I just love that, you know, we went from pedestrians and bicycling and now maybe I need a plan for roller skating. It's, yeah. it's so cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's funny. I was uh, just up in uh, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, filming an open streets event and uh at, at the terminus of the of the 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 mile plus long uh route that they had there there was a roller derby uh demo mm -hmm. going on and it was uh these young uh girls i mean they were all in their um i would say they're they're like tweens you know and and they're they you know they're clearly part of a team they've learned roller derby and so they were mm -hmm. you know sort of jostling and doing it all this but yeah it brought back memories to my childhood of roller rinks and, and, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So, and it's, I mean, it yeah. shows you that, you know, I think I'm pretty creative, but that sometimes it is just a matter of clearing the cars away yeah, and then asking people, what do you want to do with the space? I'm not going to tell you yes. what is possible. Like you just, you let me know. Yeah. And for Oaklanders, we're so creative. You know, you get a boom yeah. box out there and you can do anything. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I guess that brings us back to, you know, some of the learnings is like maybe what we should be thinking about um, and advising cities to be uh, thinking about and, and the way that they approach things is to ask questions in a different manner. Yeah. And it's, I think you um, alluded to it a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could spend a whole three hours talking about this, but I want to give you just a quick example of like, Gee, we didn't ask the right question. So when I was at Community Designer Architecture, I helped design a protected bikeway on Telegraph Avenue that runs virtually the full length of the city from downtown Oakland almost up to the Berkeley border. And the conversation was, how do we, like the main framing was, how do we make the street safer for people primarily bicycling and then by extension walking across the street? Right. And, you know, we're only now constructing its final form. So that's right. like eight years? Yikes. Yep. Yep. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that one of the major areas of pushback from both the Koreatown Northgate uh, business district and from the Temescal district, just, you know, about 20 blocks north from there, both of them said, don't take our parking spaces away because our businesses will close. During the Flex Streets program uh, in Temescal, I want to say, this is not a statistical statement, but I want to say half of the parklets are now, or half of the parking spaces are now turned into parklets. Right. And there was just a brief moment where I don't know where people got this idea, but that like the city was going to take away parklets. I'm like, I don't know where you got that, but we're, we're going to make them permanent. <laughs> right. And they're like, I hope so. Please, you know, we need more parklets. I'm like, you're all the same people who yeah. were going to run me out of town because I was yeah. taking your parking spaces away. But I share that as a story because I think that had we started, mind you, 10 years ago, practically, yeah. asking people what it, you know, we want to narrow the street so that people are walking and bicycling and driving and taking transit safely. What would you like to do with the rest of the space? Like, what what would serve you? I, I think that that would have been a really different conversation. Similarly, I think about how Oaklanders actually really like greenways because folks like to mm -hmm. kind of walk their dogs and so on. Um, you know, kind of in a linear park. And yeah. so one of the things that Oak Dot has started doing is reconsidering where we said to have a protected bikeway, could that instead be a, a greenway? Right. Because it still accomplishes the same goal of, of helping people walk and bike safely, but it meets the spirit of, of where people are at in terms of like what they need in their neighborhood. Right. And so starting kind of from like a here's how much space you have. Imagine you can do anything with this, right? Yeah. Like imagine and sometimes, if you And had... sometimes it's a lot of space. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> this is a great example. And I, I have been, 
even outside of the city, I, I feel like my staff, my now ex staff, are probably so tired of me being like, guys, you should try this. But I, I think I'm, I've got them to this now, where um, I really want cities to think about every time someone is doing construction yeah. on a street. You know, this is Webster and 19th Street in downtown Oakland, next to actually a number of um, brand new uh, for, uh, market rate high rises. Yeah. But this street is three lanes wide, plus a Brufford bike lane, plus plus. Uh, parking on either side. It's yeah. really, really wide. Yeah. And I mean, I was just down there today and most days that I'm down there, someone has closed off at least at least one lane of traffic plus the bike lane. Yeah, I'm going find, to find that other photo. Yeah. Please. And, and so it's funny to me that we had these arguments about like we couldn't possibly close a lane because there's going to be so much traffic and we're missing out on the opportunity to show people like this lane has actually been, yeah, here it is. This lane has been closed more than it has been open. <laughs> and you can see this is like the middle of the day. It's like right. the lunch hour, yeah. not a lot of traffic. And so I want cities to really think about using this as an opportunity to say, while you're here, do you mind just putting a traffic counter out so that we can show people that like, or even a camera, that at no point was this ever backed up as if that should be the metric for whether or not we choose to make our streets safe as whether or not cars are backing up. But even if that were the metric, you would find that especially in cities like Oakland, where we overbuilt and never you know, kind of delivered on the traffic patterns sure. that we need to be reclaiming the space for something more. Yeah. And that instead of, you know, seeing construction here on the weekends, we could start to show people what it might look like to have a market along the street, right? Yeah. Showing these sort of temporary options to folks so that they can experience them, you know, sort of a try it before you buy it, yeah. I think would be a really great experience for folks who understandably are not you know, engineers, traffic planners, or, or urban designers who stare at a, a plan view diagram of space, but are not otherwise able to experience it um, for yeah. themselves. Yeah, it's a great example of, um, uh, Leonard Now uses the, the phrase that it's, it's the great uh, uh, example of how traffic just evaporates. You know, the cars just evaporate. I mean, we saw it across the bay there uh, when the Nimitz Freeway went down the Barcadero area uh, after the earthquake. What was that? 89, that earthquake. Yep. And, you know, it's just, where, where'd the traffic go? They don't know. It just evaporated. It and just evaporated. Just, yeah, pe people will find a different way around. Uh, and, by the way, if we're able to transform some of this space, this excess space, clearly it's mm -hmm. excess space. We've demonstrated right. that it is into a greenway. You might just have some mode shift. Imagine that. Absolutely. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Imagine. You talked about, you know, telegraph heading towards, uh, you know, the, the, the city limits of, of Berkeley and the reality that these are really, like you said, it's not a huge footprint. The city is not that massive of a footprint. So when we look at the number of miles that people can take on a uh, on a bike um, for a reasonable trip, um, it's very possible that you, you're you're pa passing over into other municipalities like Emeryville, oh. like into Berkeley, et cetera. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that in terms of you know that that coordination from a regional uh, transportation uh, perspective from uh, from the you know as a cycle network, thinking about it not just as a city but as as the region. That's a great question, John. And you know it's funny, Mayor Bowders and I. Uh, talked a lot about this when I first got the job at the city of Oakland in the mayor's yeah. office where he's like, can we work together a little better? Yeah. Because your bike lanes over here, my, you know, I'm being figurative here, but he's yeah. like, I want to put the bike lane over here and you want to put it over here. Like yeah. are the people who are biking are going to notice that yeah. these things are not lined up. Yeah. And I think that that says a lot about the way that we plan our streets, the way that we plan our capital improvements, right? Like our bike network ideally should fit perfectly with the other networks throughout the bay. Right. And because people don't just, most people anyway, don't just travel within their city. Exactly. In the bay, we have yeah. over 100 cities, nine counties. If you go two miles from, so I'm in, I'm in the northern area of West Oakland. Yeah. If you go north two miles, you've gone through two different cities and then back into Oakland. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, you will literally go through Emeryville, then Berkeley, then back into like it's it doesn't yeah. make sense sometimes 
what, like why we're not working more closely. And I, I think the reason for that, and I touched on this a bit with my interdisciplinary discussion of our, our emergency team, right, right, right. is that our cities are not rewarded for working together. We're not even right. set up to work together effectively. Yeah. And, and that's why, and I, I'm glad to start seeing this both from the county level. There's a, a, a county transportation body called Alameda CTC that um, actually assesses an additional sales tax increment that helps fund inter uh, city transportation improvements right. and they have their own le- own level of bureaucracy but they also have a commission that is sort of um, from a number of different mayors and city uh, city council members throughout the, the county of Alameda to help guide what like a countywide group um, should be looking at right similarly right. we've got the regional transportation body the Metropolitan Transportation Commission another layer layer of government uh, making decisions about what a regional travel pa- pattern and, and travel uh, infrastructure should look like. Right. It's not perfect, but we are starting to see advances in the space. But, but I think most importantly, and this is for folks who primarily look at transportation and then try and find transportation solutions to transportation problems, is that lately I have been trying to encourage people to understand that housing and its location uh, – is probably the biggest lever, the most powerful tool we have when it comes to affecting regional, countywide, and even citywide travel decisions. That right. if you lived closer to your job, then that would immediately predict the ways in which you're able to travel right. from home to work. And then by extension, if you lived closer to a grocery store, if you live closer to your kid's school, yeah. all of those things being in your community in a walkable or bicycle bikeable distance will then predict your ability to get to them by walking and biking. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, that's, and that's by so saying it that way, by saying in your community, that's irrespective of city borders because you, that's right. In your community, if you draw a you know a five mile radius from from where you're at and say, yeah, all of my meaningful destinations are within this. And that might mm-hmm. be passing over, uh, you know, in into Emeryville and Berkeley and back into Oakland again. Um, what's interesting too, you just mentioned about the county, and it, it made me, it led me to think the state too. So in many cities, when they see a road that looks like this, it's frequently actually a state-owned road. Yeah, that's true, and you know, great point. I am really proud of the transition that Caltrans is making our state DOT to reconsider their impact on communities as well, that that they do have the power to transform their rights of way to meet uh, not just the needs of drivers (laughs) and to truly consider what it's what being a complete street would look like. And what's been kind of neat is that like 10 years ago now, there was a state mandate for complete streets that, you know, you had to consider all modes of travel. And it feels like we've continued to kind of layer on to that. But it also speaks uh, quite strongly to the value of leadership, having a governor that supports uh, alternative modes of travel, having a Caltrans director that supports alternative modes of travel, having a CalSTA, which is the planning body, um, you know, support alternate modes of transportation, like all of those are so critical. And as a really keen example, um, you'd shown a, a photo of San Pablo Avenue where we'd put a, um, an essential place treatment. That is actually a countywide product, actually two counties. Uh, the full length of San Pablo runs from uh, Oakland City Hall mm-hmm. all the way up to the city of, or I guess the town of San Pablo. So it runs like the entire coast of the like northern area of the East Bay. Right. And Alameda CTC is right now planning uh, a pretty aggressive project of both a bus rapid transit line plus a protected bikeway for almost the entire length of that street for as much as they can, you know, the, the right of way changes. But right. I think that that's going to be an incredibly transformational improvement where folks are going to be able to take a rapid line uninterrupted, right. the, like the full length of the county. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have I have this discussion frequently when um, the, the the term complete streets comes up, and um, 
and, and I and I try to point out, and you pointed it out earlier when you said design matters. Design is so incredibly important. And so uh, oftentimes what, what folks will say is, oh, it's like, yeah, no, this is this is a complete street. I mean, we've got the sidewalks. Mm-hmm. I've got a bike lane right there. You know, there, there's even a, a parklet, you know, on, on this street. But in reality, What's the problem? I look at this, I, <laughs> in reality, I look at this street and I say it's a complete disaster. And the reason I say it's a complete disaster is because it's not an all ages and abilities facility. It's not a right. it's not a place where you're really going to make a difference when it comes to encouraging people to change their lifestyle to adopt active mobility this is not a welcoming environment from a design perspective it's not you know not there and so it's it's an imperative and and encouraging to hear that um the cal that that the california state uh, dot is is heading in a positive direction and i just and i I caution, I just hope that if that's the case, um, we don't see more of, you know, kind of that approach of, oh, yeah, no, we, we've got your bike lane. You should be happy <laughs> now. Funny. It's got to be, well, it, it's got to be authentic. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's interesting. I, th- I think about, you know, putting yourself in other people's shoes, so to speak. Yeah. You know, you ask people, oh, do you think the street's safe? And they're like, yeah, it's fine. And then you ask, but then if you ask them, would you let your kid... Right. Walk on the street. Yeah. Even if you were on the street, but just to run ahead right. a few feet. Yeah. The moment you apply that that lens, we're like, oh God, no. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Would you, you know, have you ever How walked about a crossing distance for your eighty four year old right. grandmother? Exactly. You know, the moment that you cross the street with someone who's slower, right? right. Like I'm an able bodied dude. Like yeah. Yeah. I can barely get across the street. And I <laughs> I remember um this is a very odd example, but yeah. um for a short time my stepmom was in, was using a wheelchair after a, a collision, and I, I understand, you know, the American Disabilities Act, and I understand kind of the reasoning behind a lot of the rules. But some of them, I was like, I don't, I don't get that. Why, like, why is that? And just wheeling her, you know, helping her in her wheelchair, I was like, oh, that's why a quarter of an inch difference on a sidewalk matters because I, I literally can't get you over that. Right. Or, you know, why crosswalks need to end with and begin with um, curb ramps. Yeah. The number yeah. of times curb ramps were, in, were blocked or full of water. It's like, this is so yeah. undignified or, or, yeah. and, you know, and it brings us back to this photo that we had exactly. here too. Of, uh, you know, we've got the person in the wheelchair and now they have a refuge Island to be able to break up that, that transition from getting from one side of the street to the next. That's right. It's, it, you know, I don't know what it's, I mean, I have an idea of what it's going to take to get people to live through other people's experiences. But I think the beginning of what that looks like is charging our elected leaders with riding transit that they make decisions for, riding a bike on bike lanes that they either agreed or disagreed with, right? Getting you in know, a wheelchair and trying to get in a wheelchair. Way. Yeah. Exactly. The moment, I mean, it takes all of five seconds before you realize, oh, yeah. I see now why the advocates are telling me that this feels unsafe. Yeah. And it's up to you then to decide if you have enough courage to make the right decision that meets everybody's needs and deprioritizes sometimes the loudest people in the room, but also people who feel that cars are king and that speed is the most important variable in our travel. So knowing what you know now, <laughs> how would you do it again? What would, how would you approach it differently? Uh, I would sleep more. Um, How would I do it differently? I I think that it was important to make many of the mistakes we did. You know, I I know a lot of people would say, oh, I would avoid all the mistakes I made and do it the correct way the first time. It's not going to happen. You know that. Yeah, that's not going to happen. And and I'm uh, hyper pragmatic in that way. I think that making the mistakes and then admitting that we made a mistake and that we were going to fix it was a major part of the way that we built trust. I I don't think that there was any version of this program that was going to be done perfectly from the beginning. I I don't think that we could go back to April of 2020 and say, well, of course, had we done the essential places first, then people would be happy with us. But the constraints of the emergency, right, like responding literally overnight, prevented us from having the perfect communications rollout, the perfect timing 
of where the signs went and so on. Uh, I think that we really can only look forward into, you know, if there's ever going, and I think there will be an, another version of slow streets, whether in Oakland or, you know, in San Francisco or in the Bay Area, that we continue to fail fast, that we, I don't want people to take from this that we shouldn't have done it, but that we should be doing programs like this more often with the understanding that the city is going to learn very quickly from our mistakes, but also learn how to do things in a rapid way. You, you know, shortly before slow streets had occurred, I, I was on an apology tour for not moving fast enough when people were getting hit by cars. Right. And so I would, and this is a difficult thing to say, I would rather apologize for moving too quickly with, in the spirit of trying to save lives than moving too slowly, knowing where the danger was and that we could have addressed, we could have addressed it with urgency. Yeah. So that knowledge that you have now, how are you leveraging that in Lighthouse and, and what you're working with and how you're guiding uh, cities and, 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 and communities moving forward? Absolutely. The first and foremost is reminding government agencies what's truly possible and, and that it is just a matter, just a matter of uh, increasing our risk tolerance and also working as a collaborative team. But so much of my time you know, with my clients now is spent trying to pull together all of the right stakeholders from even government agencies to have the most collaborative conversation to like meet their needs. The other bit is advising both you know, clients, governments, uh, and even uh, small business owners to reach out to just the right stakeholders in the community who are not always who you think they are, that it's not just the loudest voices or even understanding why the loudest voices feel the way that they do, that it is often a deeper, more challenging narrative that we need to uh, daylight as quickly as possible to make the right decisions, whether to invest in a housing development or to um, you know, move forward with a nonprofit partnership. Understanding those narratives has been so critical now to the ways that I'm able to advise all the people I'm working with. Yeah. I love it. It's good stuff. Warren, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been such an honor. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning into this episode with Warren Logan. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, <laughs> please give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below. And uh, please do share it with a friend. Uh, it's so incredibly important to spread the message. And uh, if you haven't already done so, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just uh, click on that uh, subscription button down below. And uh, make sure that you ring the notifications bell next to it as well so that you can customize your notifications when I produce new content. Uh, and I will be back next week with another episode. And until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Also sending out a very big thank you to all my amazing Active Towns ambassadors who are directly supporting my efforts through Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, the YouTube Super Chats and Super Thanks, as well as buying things from the Active Towns store and making donations to the nonprofit. Every little bit helps and is greatly appreciated. Thank you all so very much.